Hi guys, welcome back. In my last video, I shared some of my experience and opinions about Discovery. This week, I did a little research on Discovery that I wanted to share with you guys today. What are the rules and how are the courts applying those rules? And at the end, I'm going to talk about a couple of annoying Discovery tricks and illustrate those with some cases. Before we get into it, I want to remind you that I am not an attorney and Discovery is a much more complex subject than I can present in this one little video. So you definitely want to do your own research and if at all possible, consult a good employment attorney before you use this stuff. And with that said, here we go. Last time I talked about a couple of arguments that my attorney used during Discovery that were based around privilege and relevance. But there's a third factor that I didn't really mention, proportionality. And we can use any of these three factors as the basis of our arguments in Discovery, whether we're arguing for a request we made or pushing back on an employer's unreasonable request. A request for information that's non-privileged, relevant, and proportional to the needs of the case is going to be granted. Proportionality is a rule that says the burden of producing the Discovery has to be proportional to what's at stake in the case. And to determine what's proportional, there are four considerations the court takes into account importance of the issues at stake, importance of the requested discovery in resolving those issues, amount of controversy, burden of producing the requested discovery, and who bears it. Based on these considerations, the court will decide on proportionality when considering motions to compel, objections to discovery, and other disputes. Now let's take a quick look at some cases that illustrate these four considerations. One, importance of the issues at stake. In Salazar v. McDonald's, McDonald's was asked to provide wage and hour records for a broad class of employees. McDonald's said it was overly broad, but the court found the request was actually proportional because of the overall importance of the issues at stake. The reason Salazar's attorneys were seeking the information in the first place was to determine if a class action was more appropriate. So even though their discovery request was burdensome, it was still allowed. Importance of the issues at stake can also relate to how many other cases are going to be affected by the outcome of this one. Broader discovery may be allowed when there's potential that the case can affect many others, or different types of cases. 2. Importance of the discovery in resolving the issues at stake. In Rivera v. Nibco, during deposition, Nibco asked a lot of questions about Rivera's immigration status. Rivera objected because Title VII covers all workers in the U.S. as long as we're members of a protected class. It doesn't require us to be citizens. Therefore, Rivera's immigration status was never going to impact the outcome of the case, so Nibco wasn't allowed to go there. 3. Amount of controversy In Dow v. Liberty Mutual, Liberty estimated it would take 27,000 hours for them to gather a particular block of information that Dow was requesting. And that information was only relevant to damages that were in dispute, and that was about $2,000. So 27,000 hours worth of effort to decide $2,000? Not proportional. 4. The burden of producing the evidence and who bears it. Henry v. Morgan's Hotel Group was a race and sexual orientation discrimination claim. Morgan's asked to depose three of Henry's former employers, but the court said no because granting that request would have imposed a significant burden on three employers that weren't even parties to the case. So those should help you understand what the considerations are. While I was researching the cases I wanted to talk about today, I ran across a couple of dirty discovery tricks that I wanted to share with you guys. The first one is refusing to provide discovery, and then on the heels of that, filing a motion for summary judgment. This is a real one-two punch, and I was surprised to see how common it really is. It happened in Bobo versus UPS. Bobo, a black man, was fired for an infraction. He identified several similarly situated comparators and requested discovery on them. But UPS only provided discovery on one of those comparators, a white man who was also fired for the same infraction. Bobo filed a motion to compel. UPS argued that having to provide the information he wanted was burdensome and non-relevant because they didn't consider the others to be legitimate comparators. The district court let UPS off the hook, and then a couple of days later, UPS filed a motion for summary judgment. And they got it because the discovery they had provided showed that they'd treated a white guy just the same way they did Bobo. The appeals court found that Bobo's initial discovery request should have been granted, and they overturned UPS's summary judgment. Game two is fishing expeditions. And this one we touched on last time, but this week I found a couple cases where the courts called it out by name, so I wanted to share those with you. Tingle versus Hebert is a retaliatory wrongful termination case. In discovery, Hebert requested all texts and emails, 
sent or received, even the deleted ones, between Tingle and any former or current employee from any accounts that Tingle had maintained or accessed. Everything. The court called it a fishing expedition, a blind search for anything Hebert could use as a defense, and they restricted discovery to the relevant time frame and subject matter. And there's also Hedenberg versus Aramark, a discrimination case. Aramark requested a mirror image of Hedenberg's home computer. They said they were looking for personal correspondence with unnamed third parties that might reveal discrepancies in her testimony. And they cited some case law where access to personal computers was granted in employment cases. But the court observed that in all the cases Aramark cited, the contents of the computer in question was directly related to a specific issue of the case. Aramark, on the other hand, was hoping blindly to find something that they could use to impeach Hedenberg. I found a bunch more cases using Google Scholar, and I'll share the keywords that I used with you in the description so that you can check those out yourself. And I'll also share some other resources that I found so you can read up on Discovery. There's a lot more to it than I've talked about today, but last week and this one should give you a decent overview and some suggestions that you can use just in case your employer tries to abuse the discovery process. I'll see you guys in the next one. Until then, take care and hang in.